We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Vanessa, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, literally 30 seconds ago, we were talking, we were saying how um, nerves come in when you're doing a podcast and thing. And I wonder if it's got something to do with the fact that you're being interviewed now. You're not actually, you're a guest, you know, is that anything do you reckon? Yeah. It's funny because it's, I still even sometimes get nervous when I'm sitting down with myself to, <laughs> to, to record an episode for my podcast. But yeah, I think it is that I'm a guest and, um, and I was saying before we hit record, I kind of laugh at myself because if I do experience a bit of anxiety or nervousness beforehand, I will over prepare. Yeah. So, so I was saying to you so much of what I talk about, I like, I know it in my head and in my heart and I embody it like the, the work, but yeah, beside me is four pages of notes. <laughs> that's so good. So if you see me look over, that's a yeah. little bit what's happening. <laughs> There's a book there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. good. But that yeah. speaks to like, um, you know, you embodying, the work that you do, like even just from a broader perspective, as a clinician, as a therapist, you know, we, we come into this work because we're interested in it. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that I, I believe personally, and it's, you know, pretty conclusive in the literature that anxiety is all about uncertainty. So what better way to reduce that uncertainty by creating a very in-depth plan and mapping it out as you've done. Exactly. I kind of view it as, um, the, these four pages of notes in a way are compassion to myself because it's going, if my nervous system for whatever reason needs a little bit of extra support in this small way, then we just do that. Yep. We don't judge it. Totally. Totally. Yeah. The, the judging thing is um, it's such a major roadblock, isn't it? When we to like even begin to explore ourselves and move the needle, we have to get rid of all that bullshit that says we shouldn't, we're not good enough. I suck. I'm a loser. You know, it's like, Hey, this is where we're at. Let's just, we'll start there. It's all good. You know? I know. And how many times do you hear clients do this too, of they will share something and then whether it's kind of an experience or an emotion and they immediately minimize it, dismiss or judge it. So they might say, well, I'm feeling this. And then they'll go, that's so stupid, isn't it? Yes. Or, or they'll share this kind of like heartbreaking story or experience they've had and they'll quickly go oh but I bet you hear so much worse mm, yeah right and so this is like 101 to me yep. of compassion work is let's just sit with the messiness that's here without judging it totally yeah well look I think that's a great segue um so Vanessa and I for everyone listening are, are, are friends and we were introduced um, through a friend of both of ours. Um, she's a much closer friend with you, but I'm slowly starting to, <laughs> she's lovely. Heidi, we've, we've yeah. had her on the show a couple of times. Um, this is kind of the, the area I think that you and I really wanted to discuss. Um, it's this, the, the, the world as it is today, anger's everywhere. And it's so easy to hide behind the phone and just attack and dismiss and judge based upon our own conditioning and, and, and ideas about what other people are saying. Yeah. And, um, one of the ones that I wanted to bring up was, so in my opinion, you would hear some people hear the word compassion and they immediately pull you into this idea of, Oh, you're one of those weirdo therapists that say, Oh, you know, accept people exactly where they're at. There's no need to do any self-development work. You're trying to just, you know, really lazy. And I hope that, everything that you and I have just discussed shows that how you actually need compassion in the beginning, if you actually want to start to move the needle. But I think, you know, this whole idea about coming together and I think it's going to be a really great chat between you and I, especially with the work you do. But yeah, before we get into about a little bit about who you are and what you do for work, do you have any thoughts on, on that? 
I had lots of thoughts, but one is I think if if we grew up in an environment where we weren't permitted the permission or it wasn't modeled to really soften towards ourselves and be kind to ourselves, it can feel threatening mm. um, or at least kind of foreign to us. But what we know is when we can meet ourselves with that kindness and compassion, we are more likely to make sustainable change. We're more likely to take responsibility for our behavior. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think certain life experiences can make that hearing that word compassion. Yes. We go to a place of people mistake it for pity. So they'll think like, oh, I don't want to just sit around and feel sorry for myself. And it's actually, there's a massive difference between pity and compassion. Mm. Um, and one big difference is that I see is, you know, pity kind of, pity kind of loses the the idea of other people are struggling too. I think that's the big key thing of, um, you know, I think we've been all, we've all been around people like this, or we've experienced it ourselves where we're kind of really in that mode of, I have it worse than everybody else. And we mm. can kind of forget, whereas compassion holds common humanity where the human condition comes with some level of struggle and suffering. And we can hold that we can have empathy for other people struggling, but we can still validate our own, mm. you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 I feel like that was a way better way of describing it. Oh. <laughs> the way I described that was awesome. That exactly. I could I could not honestly agree more. Well, that's um that's brilliant. So yeah. So why don't you tell the the listeners um and the viewers, I suppose, a little bit about your background and 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 your your niche in 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 the mental health world. Yeah. So um I've been kind of working in therapy and assessment for like 14 years now. And the majority of that has been working with people who have experienced trauma and complex trauma. Um, and then, of course, I see people experiencing all different kind of life challenges, grief, loss, um, anxiety, like we spoke about. Mm. And then kind of more over the last few years, I've moved. I still my heart is still very much in the trauma work. I don't think I'll ever move away completely from that. But I've moved more into this looking at our relationship with food and looking at our relationship with our bodies. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I think there's this real misconception around body image work or a stereotype that it's, to be honest, it seems like it's usually a thin white uh, teenage girl looking in the mirror and just kind of distressed that she doesn't look like a supermodel. Mm. And it's so much deeper than that. And what we know is people of all kind of races, people of all genders, of all, all ages can experience body shame and body image struggles. Mm. Um, and so I, I suppose that's kind of professionally where I've been is I've really created a way to work with the self-compassion, the shame work, the trauma work, but within that body and food space. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you as well, because I think stereotype exists, you know, whether you like it or not. And we all, yeah. you know, we've, we've kind of evolved to make judgments and it's annoying, but that, you know, we've also evolved to gossip and do all these shitty things that we know we shouldn't do, but it's what we do, you know? And yeah. I think, um, you know, myself being in the, you know, the health and fitness industry before I made the move to therapy, I was in yes. that, you know, I was in that world for 10 years and I saw so much body shame from people that you would think would be against this movement or this work, you know, yeah. heaps of dudes ripped, huge, you know, hating who they are. Yeah. Can't train enough, you know, has to be more calories. Everything's bad for you. You know, have to drink two, three protein shakes every two hours, you know, ruin yeah. sleep and so much just, um, external expectation or perceived external expectation. And just, you know, and I think men can hide behind this kind of shield of anger that, you know, makes us look like it's our choice that we're doing this, you know? Um, but you and I both know very well that behind anger is pain and suffering. And it's, yeah. you know, just because, um, you know, women or other stereo, you know, how, how, whether we look at it might be giving off some other idea, you know, it's still happening on the other front. And I think, yeah, it's coming back to that first point, you know, if we can remove the shame and just go, okay, this is exactly where I'm at and I'm not pumped about it. 
from what it sounds like to me is that your work, it, do, it doesn't really matter too much about what happens on the external. You know, you can look like however you want to look like, but as long as you enjoy looking that way, that's, I think, where the work is. Is that is that right? Yeah. So a couple, well, my head went in a few directions as I was listening to what you were saying. And one is the way that specifically the fitness industry, but lots of places can normalize disordered eating or yeah. eating disorders and in fact kind of reward it mm. um, so this is where we might have someone struggling with binge eating for example or bulimia or anorexia yeah. or orthorexia which is um orthorexia is not listen i have my complaints about the dsm so i i don't like pathologizing the human experience but the orthorexia is not in the dsm but we're seeing it lots in the eating disorder space where it's this real obsession with like clean eating and yeah, fear around chemicals and toxins and so mm -hmm. what i see is people can be engaging in this really problematic food behavior but externally they're getting rewarded. Yes. They're getting complimented. People are going, you look so great. What's your secret? People are going like, Oh my God, how do you have that level of self-control when under the surface they're going, I still feel, do you swear on here? All the fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're going, I feel like <sighs> shit. I never feel good enough. Despite the reflection in the mirror, I still have this kind of inner hurt and pain. Mm. And yes, what I see with men more is men are conditioned to, I think really the only emotion they're conditioned to like have permission to show is anger. Yeah, totally. And then they're also conditioned, I think, to be the problem solver. Mm. And so the idea of, well, what's sitting under my anger, what pain is there and really having to sit and connect with it without jumping into solving it. And I think that's, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I think something else. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. I'm curious what you're thinking. Yeah. Cause I could just keep going. Yeah. Well that, I mean, that's such a great point. Um, so that was so orthorexia I, cause I've not heard of that. That's really yeah. interesting. It's funny. You said, um, got your qualms with uh, the TSM, the last show Heidi and I did together. We just, kind of tore it, Bagged it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it was pretty it's interesting like, yeah. copped a yeah. bit of flack for that one but that's all right you, you have to cop that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we try to justify it you know because reassurance can be great in in you know in the beginning i know i'm preaching to the choir here and, and everything but um eventually you know when you're in that state labels just become our saviors don't they and it's just like how do we move beyond these things when yeah the criteria is so narrow minded and checklisted and, and so forth. But you, yeah. you, you, you're so right. I think about men um, having that um, societal expectation to be, and I think it is changing, hopefully mm -hmm. slowly, gradually. Um, but if there is this real need to be the problem solver. Um, and again, this is, this is where, you know, this is why I really want to, this is why I really look forward to doing this show with you because um when people hear something, the mind as a self-regulating system assumes that they disagree with the opposite of that straight away, automatically, you know? So when I say, guys, <laughs> men are conditioned to be the problem solver, it's not that I'm saying I don't think they should ever be the problem solver. I know. <laughs> I know. Just by the way. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's something that, I've been listening to someone named Africa Brooke. Oh, she's, yeah, she's great. Are you from, you're familiar with her? Yeah, 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 yeah. And she refers to, I think some of what you're talking about is having a binary brain and a complex world. Yes. And so, yes, this, it's, I do think it stems from a place of survival and really trying to avoid any sort of discomfort. Um, and so we can take really complex issues, like some of what we'll talk about today, mm. and people can really jump to this all or nothing, this black and white way of thinking this, we see it all the time, right? Like this, I'm either for or against it. I'm either for or anti, mm. um, and, and then it polarizes us. And so even having conversations like we'll have and inviting people into different spaces and 
being curious about different work going on, mm. I think this is something that can come up. So I always encourage people like just notice when your brain jumps to that kind of all or nothing or black and white way of thinking. Yeah. It's usually a sign where like, Ooh, this feels uncomfortable. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, I think in, in our line of work, that's where the magic is, you know, the trigger, the discomfort, the sensation, you know, and, um, I think the other thing beyond that as well, that's also a real truism in our, I mean, in, in you know, I'm not trying to sound superior or anything. I, I love our line of work. It's really fun. That's why I do it. But I think it, it's in every line of work really is that the actual truth is found in the paradox, you know, and I was, I, the reason I was saying our line of work is because we often talk about distinctions between the rational brain and the emotional brain. Yeah. Sure. There are different aspects of the brain, but part of uh, coming together in wholeness is actually listening to two sides. And it's kind of like being able to hold the coin and giving thanks to both heads and tails. And that's paradox. That's what life is in a nutshell. And I think the whole thing about this, this, these polarizing conversations is that, you know, blue, red, left, right, exercise, you know, body acceptance is they're all the same thing. It's all night and day, yin and yang, you know, man, woman, whatever it is. And really the truth of all of that, that connects it is it's all a coin. <laughs> yeah. You know? The, yeah. There's so much um, growth and I think understanding and opportunity in the gray area. Mm. Um, and something else you said, so the paradox and how many times do you find yourself saying something similar to this? Cause I, I predict it's just every day. Like I do, but <laughs> there multiple truths can exist. Totally. <laughs> I, I, that comes up in therapy all the time. So if someone is saying, um, maybe giving voice to the way their parents have hurt them mm. in their lives, they really kind of quickly go, Oh, but you know, they feel guilty for articulating yes. that or, and, and then they'll, they'll immediately be like, but, but my mom's like a really nice person and she really loved us. And she did this yes. and this and this. And I'm going both true. Both of these experiences can be true for you. Mm. Parts of your mom you were loving and generous. And then also she may have intentionally or inten unintentionally caused hurt. And yes. you can sit with both. That's a great point. Vanessa. Why do you think people struggle with that? Cause you know, the, the one that pops into my mind is, um, oh, I could kill my kids, dot, 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 but I love them so much and everything. I know. Why do people struggle with being able to rest in those two worlds? I don't know if it's some of what we were talking about earlier, where the, the judgment kicks in or they feel guilty for saying something. I don't know if there's an element of shame, um, but that's a perfect example. Parents who... <laughs> 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 you know might vent about the struggles of parenthood and then yeah really quickly I think shame themselves for saying it out loud mm. or feel like they have to justify it mm. yeah. yeah whereas again both are true I love my child and she's driving me nuts like <laughs> <laughs> totally Totally. Yeah. I know part of the reason why I was 15 minutes late today was, well, the entire reason was because I wanted to kill my dogs, I know. but they're also really fun and weird. And they were also super cute. <laughs> yes. I know. I can't take any of the credit for photos because I think someone else who lives here uh, yeah. is, is killing it on that level. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah, so why don't we come back to the line of work? Cause I'm really interested yes. in, um, in, in what you see typically. Um, so yeah. So, so what, what are you seeing with, with a lot of your clients? Well, I think there's a few things. One is, and, and this is where I encourage people to really kind of hang out in the gray for this conversation, because when I first started doing this, my own work in this, I read a few chapters of a book, slammed it shut, rolled my eyes and just like judged the shit out of it. Sure, right? sure. Um, but one is kind of what you were talking about at the beginning with what you saw in your own work in the fitness area mm. is diet culture. This is something I see and it can, even that word I think can cause fairly strong responses. Um, but when I say diet culture, I'm referring to, I mean, the diet industry, it's like yep. a $78 billion 
industry yeah. for a year. Yep. And it's this, I think, system that teaches us that to be healthy or happy, we need to look a certain way. We need to pursue really thinness at all costs. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of what we were talking about, the system that really glorifies thinness. Yep. And 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 it's tricky because, like I said earlier, there's this real assumption that someone in a thinner body is automatically ha- healthier and happier where mm. we don't, that's just, abs- that's just not true, mm. right? Like we can have someone in a thin body still struggling with shame or guilt or whatever. Yep. And, and really not healthy in a lot of ways. And so one of the things that I see is the way diet culture has sort of shaped people's internal experience. Mm. Right. So they, they kind of, um, and of course the other system is media, Of course, right? Yeah. Like when I was growing up, it would have been more kind of magazines and celebrity photos and just these, these headlines that actually, that absolutely pick apart specifically women's bodies. Yeah. And now it's more in the social media space. Right. And it's again, all these messages about what our bodies are supposed to look like, what food we're supposed to be eating, how much mm. confusion is there around that? Like, yeah. Um, you know, and I know this is where I'm not knocking. If someone's listening to their body and they go this, this way of eating works for me. Great. But the people that I tend to see are people going, I cannot go on another restrictive diet. I can't like, they kind of reach this point in their soul where they're like, there has to be another way. I can't restrict gluten and dairy and carbs and count calories all the time and be kind of like stuck on this app. It's Mm, mm. so that's, that's a lot of what I see is how are these wider systems affecting the way people feel about themselves and the way they're choosing to conduct themselves? Yeah. Yeah. People who are fed up, pardon the pun. Yes. <laughs> Couldn't help what, it. <laughs> it's such a good pun. Yeah. What, what, I'm curious, what do you hear? Like when I explain diet culture, especially like. Yeah. Well, well I hear, so I, I hear a lot of, I think what, you hear and I, my my biggest issue that I found on the podcast is that because I love to talk and I love to bounce ideas off each other I'm in, I, I get a lot of people who I tend to agree with already yeah. <laughs> so I need to um, perhaps expand my horizons a bit and get into some interesting debates and things <laughs> um, so that's that's one side of things but look when I hear diet and, and I think you and I both agree with this our primary concern professionally, but what I would hope that everyone in the world would want to aim for is um, a life where they're happy and thriving. That's it. That's all we're really in the business of. Yeah. I don't really care what you do, you know, and I don't want to care because I want to care about myself. Yeah. But if you're not happy, well, then there's some work to do there, like with all of us, you know, and that's going to be a journey. We're always progressing towards, um, you know, goals and ideals and and things of that nature. But what I hear in diets, so what I, what I've seen from my background and and what I think a diet means, because obviously the nuances in the definitions and we all have subjective definitions, unfortunately, um, a diet, I, I think, and what I've seen it was always intended to be temporary. Now I see people dieting down to, to get into weight classes for jujitsu competitions and MMA competitions. I've seen people dieting temporarily to bulk, to hit um, PBs in the weights room or whatever it is. Yeah. I've never thought of diet as to be this. Well, now I eat two calories a day for the rest of my life. That's insane. And gluten yeah. dairy tastes amazing. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. that's the other side to it as well. It's like, why so serious? You know, Yeah. the thing is I'm much more interested in what's making the seriousness and what's making the struggle to progress and the constant pitfalls and things. And I can't help. This is where I do agree with you in that as much as we would like to be able to solve our problems individually, when we are engrossed in an ecosystem that is designed to constantly feed itself, 
lucratively financially financially there are going to be things that are going to be need to be said yeah. for that money to continue to grow there you look at the social media world i mean it's all well and good to say there's a brilliant book called stolen focus by johan hari he put it out at the end of last year and his point i think is very similar to yours and mine in this regard it's the self development world has done really well because it's grown to a point where now there are courses and things about how to meditate to stop distracting yourself. And that's good. And it's not nothing, but when there are billions of dollars of marketing just in individual companies and corporations, not even the actual entire social media ecosystem itself to keep you addicted. Do you think that a 20 minute meditation is going to ultimately get you off your phone for good? Don't think so. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, I think part of what can be really empowering with any work, whether we're talking like food, body, kind of other, what you're talking about is increasing awareness of just noticing kind of my self-talk or the stories I tell or the thoughts, just staying so curious Mm -hmm. about what's um, shaped that, right? So like I said, beauty messages, body messages, diet culture, but also things like family of origin. Mm -hmm. Like we, if the, 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 because I work predominantly with women and when women come through um, and they start reflecting on their food and body stories, sometimes there's been like, uh, mom or dad who body shamed them or mm-hmm. put them on their first diet when they were, you know, 11. And, wow. you know, and there's research that shows us too that little girls specifically start wanting to change their bodies or losing weight as young as kind of six or seven. Wow. And so the, it is an empowering place, I think, to start of exactly what you just said, thinking of these wider systems around us. And just staying curious for a while, what am I kind of internalizing from this? And then my favorite kind of reality check is, so is this helpful, true and kind? Mm. And, and I, one of my coaches taught me that, and it's such a quick reality check and and it has to be all three. Yeah, that's cool. Otherwise we want to go, hmm. So then let's hold space to kind of really look at this. Mm. Um, so yeah. And something else I was thinking when you when you were talking is the very nature of dieting um like i said any restriction is our bodies are not our bodies are designed to fight against dieting and restriction and so exactly what you said i think people can get into this loop of dieting and restriction so it's like i don't know i'm gonna jump on please don't come for me if you like fasting and keto do you (laughs) that's it (laughs) you do you yep Uh, my number one value is autonomy so i'm like you check in with yourself and do what's best for you Mm. but what i see is this loop with the women i work with where it's like i'll jump on the next gym challenge or i'll jump on the keto and fasting thing and they might kind of see quote short-term results but our bodies fight back against that in a number of ways. And so normally it's not sustained. And so we quote fall off the wagon. Yes. And then often there's the things like binge eating or emotional eating. And then we go, the guilt and shame sets in. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just have more self-control? Why am I so lazy? Right. Mm. And we go Monday moment diet starts. Yes. <laughs> diet starts next month. Diet starts on Monday. Diet starts in the new year. And the women I work with are stuck in that loop. Mm. And so part of what I teach is really being honest. Is this cycle, how is it helping you? Mm. Maybe it's helping you cope with some deeper issues. W- what would it be like if you continue this for the rest of your life? right? Really yep. getting them to tune in to, okay, if this loop is happening in my life, what does that mean for me? Mm. And the, the other word that I'm going to say that is probably, I'm curious what you actually think when I say this word, yeah. intuitive eating, intuitive like, eating. like tell me unedited what comes to your mind. Okay. So putting two words together, 
intuitively having this kind of intrinsic, almost gut feeling sense of what I, so the word here is, so I don't like the word should for important reasons, Ah, uh, yes. but this intuitive sense of what's right for me. Am yes. I on the money? <laughs> yes. And I, okay. it's, it's funny because sometimes I forget where I was before I started practicing this as a framework in my life. Um, because there's, oh, if you have a little bit of a play on specifically social media, there's real misconceptions around intuitive eating. Mm. Um, so people tend to, for some reason, think it just means like eat all the donuts all the time <laughs> with <Hey>. no regard <laughs> for your health. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> and, and it's, so it gets very simplified where, you know, if someone's listening and they go, oh my gosh, I totally feel stuck on that restrict binge cycle. Mm. Um, and I'm curious, is there another way intuitive eating can be a beautiful framework mm. to integrate in a way that suits the person best. That's so cool. this is what I mean on social media. It's simplified. It will be like, here's the 10 principles. And the principles are great. I do have them printed off, but it's it's much more complex and nuanced than what places like social media will show. And so when I say intuitive eating, it's a framework developed by two dietitians. Oh, they cool. started seeing their clients doing exactly what I just described. They would come in, they'd feel great. They'd be dieting. They would, they would, might be losing weight, but then they would see that actually this isn't sustained. Mm. And what research shows us is the overwhelming number of diets uh, result in some health issues, which I'll outline, but mm. also um, weight regain. Yeah. And that's for the overwhelming majority, like 97% of people within two to five years will regain yeah. what they've lost. And so this is kind of what the dietitians started seeing. And then they started seeing the guilt and the shame or people resulting to then engaging in more disordered eating to try mm. to kind of get the weight off. So to, so to speak. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> it was developed in the nineties, but now there's over a hundred research studies. I interviewed um, like a really, just, he was a really lovely guy who works. I think it was at Deacon. I might share that with you to put in your show notes, but yeah, he, yeah, cool. he's like, I don't know, top 10 researcher in the world on binge eating. Mm. And, and I interview him about some of the research coming out and it was just really interesting and helpful, mm. um, but not in a way where it's like lots of jargon. Yep. And, um, but yeah, there's over a hundred research studies, research emerging about all kind of the positive correlations with intuitive eating. Um, wow. so it's really exciting. And as you said, it is, it is kind of rather than listening to a meal plan or an influencer or a bunch of food rolls that you're not even sure wh where they have even actually come from. Yeah you, you, you move towards tuning into your own body and yes. your own body's needs and, and you're, you're getting your information kind of from a deeper body wisdom, mm. Mm. um, rather than kind of these external places. Awesome. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, I mean, that, that's like a fundamental idea in psychotherapy, you know, just get back to you, like, you know, yeah. get, get the fuck out of all these ideas that you think you should be doing. It's really hard because we are social creatures. Um, but oh, then yeah. we also need to be guided by our own Northern star yeah. and we need to find how it's like, I kind of describe it sometimes. It's like, you're really unhappy and you, you feel like there's a better way. This is like pre-existential crisis or spiritual awakening, you know, yeah. and you're in this jigsaw puzzle and it's a whole bunch of rectangles. And then one day you kind of wake up or over a couple of months, you get this sensation, like you're actually a circle and you've been a circle all your life, <laughs> yeah. but you've just been wrapped up in this rectangle and you're like, Oh, this just feel weird. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's really scary because a, you don't know where the jigsaw puzzle filled with circles is yet. Yeah. B you're not sure how to navigate between the two living 
in that isolated world where you're not in any jigsaw puzzle yeah. and B and C when you're just coming out of it, everyone's like, Hey man, what are you doing? Like, I thought you loved being a rectangle. So they're trying <laughs> to pull you back in. So it's like really hard to, to navigate I, that, you know? I know. And it's when you say that, and with, with kind of this idea of all the way back to the beginning, you know, how we were saying like binary brain in a complex world. If we move away from this dieting, there is this kind of quote anti diet space, and so it's like all of a sudden you're you're making some changes, but it fe- it feels pressure to like align with one or the other, right? Yes. You gotta, and and it's it's actually I can't emphasize enough. It's actually coming back to what works for you, mm. um, and. Intuitive eating. Can I just read the principles for anyone who's like, yeah, let's go through it. Cause I don't actually know much about this. So okay. I'd, I'd love to hear them. Mm. So these, this is, um, this is, I explain this as a gentle invitation to a framework, but not in a rule rigid way. My, okay. one of my rigidity is a red flag. So it's not coming into intuitive eating going, I need to become the perfect intuitive eater and master this. Yes. Um, but so one is, reject the diet mentality. When I teach this in my group, I reframe that as be curious about the diet mentality, because it's kind of just being curious about, well, does this show up where I'm scared to eat after 8 p.m. or I'm not allowed to eat before 1 p.m. or I'm bad if I eat this piece of cake at a birthday party. Mm. So kind of just really getting curious about where does that kind of diet diet mentality show up for a little while nice because one. Yep. people will say reject it and I'm like well we kind of have to understand it and we have to understand what it's holding together before we start to undo it so to speak yes yes um and then the, the next ones are honoring your hunger um making peace with food challenging the food police um the satisfaction factor that is a game changer. Mm. It, I haven't talked about this on here yet, but I certainly came from a background of eating disorder. And then I went through no, uh, years and years of chronic dieting. Yep. Um, and when I moved into this space, the satisfaction factor was actually really fun because it gets you to tune into what you're actually wanting. Yep. So if it's like, I'm, well, it's a cold day. So I'm really wanting something like a soul food. That's really warm and soothing. Or oh, Vanessa, maybe it's, like, it's a cold I know, day today. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, or is it a summer day where I'm like, I really want just something cold or am I wanting something sour or crunchy? Mm. And it is so exciting because no longer am I kind of checking an app to go like, am I allowed to have this? The question is, what do I actually feel like? Yeah. Um, and, and people I think are scared that, well, I'll just want to eat chocolate all the time. And I'm like, no, you won't Mm. like, think about that for a minute. Do you Mm. actually think for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks all damn day, every day you want chocolate? It doesn't, (laughs) it doesn't. Um, but then respecting your fullness, this is a, big part that can take some time because you you probably see this in your clinical practice of we are so disconnected from our bodies yeah we live from the neck up yeah and so lots of women I work with they don't even know what hunger and what fullness feels like Mm. because they've disconnected Mm. and that might be from trauma that might be, that's the way they learned to cope in their family was Mm. to kind of disconnect from their bodies and emotional experience. Um, And so this is one of my favorite parts is seeing women, as I say, come back home to their bodies Mm. and really get to know what this feels like. Mm, Um, Number seven is coping with emotions with kindness, um, respecting your body movement. So this is like a really beautiful part of intuitive eating too, is what is underneath your kind of relationship to body movement and exercise. Yeah. Um, and how do we create happiness and health in that space? Mm. Um, That's really cool. And then honoring your health with gentle nutrition. Yes. And so there is a nutrition component. One of the things we talk about is there's no moral value to food. So a donut is not bad and doesn't make you a bad person. And an apple is not good and doesn't make you a good person. Mm. 
Um, so we kind of unpack, there's no moral value to food, but there is some nutritional stuff that we want to consider. And this is the framework that I teach in the group. And it's, it's so exciting um, mm, because I see people move from this like rigid world of dieting to freedom. Yes. Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing as well is it sounds like people don't um, trust themselves. It's like the Buddhists, um, oh. you know, referred to addicts as hungry ghosts. You know, they were just worried that they, they'll just eat all the chocolate in the world and stuff. And I think, as you say, after a while that, you know, um, it's like what Alan Watts talks about. If you could, if you could be the master of every dream you ever had, you know, akin to lucid dreaming for the first couple of dreams, you just have it all, you know, you'd have the hottest yeah. people around you and you'd have all the money <laughs> you'd do whatever you want. And then eventually Can you lucid you'd... dream. I've had one. Okay. I'm trying to learn how to do it. Um, but yeah. uh, I'm also kind of afraid of it, yeah. but that's yeah. like another conversation. It's another episode. That's another episode. Yeah. Yeah. But his point is like, after a while of having it all, you'd get bored of that. And eventually you'd come back to this place of, well, you want adventure. You want a bit of challenge here and there. Yeah. And I think that I'm kind of hearing a bit of that into, into these principles. Yes. And I, I got so excited when you said, trust yourself, because that is the very essence of this is yes. coming back to trusting ourselves and our bodies to mm. know what we need and what's best for us. And you said something else. You said trust. What was the other thing you said um, before the lucid dream? Yeah, before the lucid dream. I'm not too sure. I can't oh. remember. Just this. Well, I mean, that going off that thing of trust, though, I think is um, is really good because what it means to me, as I hear it, I suppose, is I have enough to go off based upon how I've acted in the past to know that if I have a night, look, for example, last night I had four beers and a big pizza and potato wedges and I was just keen. Yeah. I just, I had a really good <laughs> I was just day. Keen. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to go to jujitsu, but I was like, fuck it. And I just yeah. got a little bit of a buzz on and I just, I don't know. I was in a good, good. I just listened to tool for like six hours last yeah. night. Yeah. Just love and love. <laughs> but, it, but yeah, I think perhaps like looking back on myself, I'm just trying to listen to my own experiences. You're, talking back when I was really competing heavily, um, I would have trained minimum two hours today and none of it would have been good enough. And I can remember even when I was very young, 18, 17, I'd go for these hectic runs at like 11 PM at night. Cause I wanted to be an AFL player, you know, and my, my cue, right. So this is for all the guys that do any of this sort of stuff yes. and girls, of course, but yeah, my, my, cue to go by, um, was I've only trained hard enough. If it's really hard for me to sit on the toilet because my legs are that sore. Now, what yes. the hell is that? Oh my gosh. Yes. You know, <laughs> this, this, this is the stuff that comes up yeah. when, when we're doing this is for so long, for, for lots of us, exercise comes more from this place of punishing ourselves for what we've eaten, compensating, kind of these no pain, no gain sort mm. of ideas um, and, and shame based. Like you said, mm. you're kind of doing two hours or an extra stuff and you're kind of still going and not enough. Yeah. So it can be this real kind of um, shame based place. And it was. Yes. For sure, for sure. And what I see in the work that, that I do in this, in the group is exercise and it takes a little while. Of course, this is not overnight shit, but it's, exercise starts to come from more a place of self-love and it, and, and you have flexibility around it. Like yeah. it's not black and white where it's, I have to do six times a week for two hours a day, or I'm not enough. Right. It can be. So in my own journey, I, it might be on one day I check in and I kind of, and I know I want to lift weights. I love lifting weights. Yeah. And so but on another day, depending on how my body's feeling emotionally, mentally, I might actually go the body movement that's going to support me most today is just a gentle kind of yoga practice. Yeah. And so it's again, it's this question coming from what do I need in yes. a compassionate way? And I'll say too, I have an inner competitive part and she is not going anywhere. So it does not mean this is where the binary stuff can come in. It doesn't totally. mean that it's like softly, softly all the time. I can't challenge myself. No, I lift 
heavy. Yeah. When I yeah, yeah. write and I feel powerful. Yes. But um, so this is just one component of the intuitive eating that's so cool is body movement starts to come from a different place, more of this self-care nurturing place. Mm. Um rather than like I said, sort some sort of like competition, not co- compensation. Totally. Well, it is like that, isn't it? And I think in the beginning, you know, um, just looking back on my my pathway in movement and exercise now, like in the big be- in the beginning, it was very much this eat and then punish. I mean, I also I'm not going to say like I didn't really enjoy it, but the thing I have now, the reason why I love jujitsu is because I learn about my mind. Really, every time I'm a little bit scared because I'm getting choked down or claustrophobic or whatever it is, there's a strong competitive element to it, but it's in my own curious curiosity about who I am through the lens of uh, movement, you know? And I think in the beginning, it was very much, it's like, it's like intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, isn't it? Do you, do you play the piano? Because if you don't, your dad would smack you with a ruler or do you play the piano because you like the way your fingers move on the, on the keys, you know, and we know which one is going to lead you to being a way better piano player. You know, the, the the first one might get you there faster, but you'll hate every second of it. That that was the thing with Andre Agassi hated playing tennis, but he came to the place where he was really, he just felt he was really good at it. And that's what he was doing. Now that sucks. Yeah. You know, yes. And it is, I think so often it's the intention behind what we're engaging in. Mm. Um, So I mentioned kind of, you know, how we like gluten, dairy, there's all kinds of foods that get demonized, but this is where the nuance is. It might be that I notice if I do have too much of something, my stomach hurts. Mm -hmm. I feel bloated. I don't, I, I feel kind of low fatigue or low energy. And I go, I don't feel great when I eat that food or eat too much of it. Mm. That's listening to your own body. Mm. So it's definitely not that binary world of like gluten is good or bad. Yes. It's going, how does it, and the same with movement. What is just what you describe with your own journey? What's the intention behind it? Is it a punitive shame-based place or is it the way you describe jiu-jitsu? Did I say it right? Yeah. (laughs) I work with, I work with three male clients right now who do that, who do that. Oh yeah. They're so hard into it. Yeah. They love it. Um, but, it, or is it that this nurtures a part of me that I, that I really enjoy it, that it's building str- strength that I like or mental strength or, mm. um, so yeah, it's just the intention behind so much of what we do is really important. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that is a really, I think that'd be one of the the major takeaways, you know, from our conversation so far yeah. anyway, it's just that it's got to come from internally and that way you, you know you, you find yourself that you're not doing and and adding this you know you said before the the no moral value like i really love that because we're so good at placing you know moral superiority or moral inferiority on things that are basically just things you yes. know like another way of like, like oh, so many you think about okay um, God, I'm so bad that I'm feeling like this resentment towards my deceased dad. It's like, yes. Is it bad that the sun is hot? It's like, yeah. well, no, it just is hot. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, you know, people are like, oh God, I'm so, I shouldn't be feeling this. If you knew how to not feel like that, would you feel like that? Yes. No, but you're feeling like that. So yes. let's get rid of all that, you know, like make space for it and, and sit with it and be with it and be curious and, yeah, that's such a good example too. I've seen that a lot with deceased, really complex feelings towards a family member who have died, who has died, and totally. That's a really good example. Um, mm. You said, I don't know what made me go to this, so I feel like it might be like switching gears a little bit. But something you said earlier made me think of it. Is you know how you said this like curious paradox is where there's so much growth and yeah. just like the good stuff yes um when the curious paradox that shows up with this kind of work is trying to unpack this moral value with food and good and bad and all these food rules is we can think and i did this in my own journey I, we have these stories that i don't have control when this certain food is around so i can't have it in the house mm. so mm. we that's that's an element of restriction yep and what happens with intuitive eating is when we start to kind of invite in these foods 
And this is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. But when we start to invite in foods, our brain gets the message that there's not scarcity around this. So it's this weird ass thing when, when I, when I was kind of healing and someone's like, well, chocolate chip cookies, just bring them back in the house. I was like, fuck you. Do you know what? Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> <Totally>. I, <laughs> I can't have those in the house. There's yeah, this, yeah. But what, but I trusted this process and I trusted myself and what, what tends to happen is this paradox of when we know it's available, when we know it's not restricted, there's this thing called the last supper syndrome where it's before we start a new diet, it's like, I'm going to eat all the things. Mm. And so we can have all of this kind of these stories around a certain food, but when we bring it back in and we give ourselves permission to enjoy it, mm. be mindful when we're enjoying it, um, have it when we want it, this fucking paradox happens that when someone said what I'm saying before I did this healing journey, I, I felt rage to be honest. Yeah. Cause I was like, you don't know me. Like you, you don't understand what's going to happen if I kind of have these quote junk foods or sweets in the house, but it's this scarcity mindset that our mm. brain starts to get out of, of, Oh, like I know that this isn't limited anymore. That's so then awesome. I don't eat it. Then I, I, I don't, I haven't been ate for a long time because of this, mm. where now it's like my brain kind of knows, oh, if I want a chocolate chip cookie, I'm going to have one. I'm going to love it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to savor it and move on. Mm. I'm not really going to go, oh my God, this is so bad. I just ruined my diet. There was too much sugar. There was too much carbs. Um, and then that level of mental restriction is what pushes us to binge on certain foods. Yes. So That's a paradox. really amazing point. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. That would be so um, liberating for people to, to move so through liberating. that. It's so liberating. I, I mean, this is a little bit vulnerable, but I've shared this before, but in my own journey, I remember my daughter, I, she, I, she had to hide her quote junk food in her room because I just was like, I can't have it around. I need to stick to my diet. I, um, you know, I'll potentially binge on it. And now it's like my pantry has like all, a variety of foods. Of course. And I know I have permission to eat and enjoy them. Yes. That's really good. Yeah. Mm. That, that really makes me think of how, um, so I've never, I've never really had a, an alcohol problem or anything. I've certainly binged and stuff in my early twenties and did heaps of drugs and things like that. <laughs> All the fun what do you stuff. do? Yeah. Went for it. <laughs> but I never really felt like I had a binge um, issue or an addiction issue or whatever it was. And I feel like mum, the way mum raised us to be interested in different, how different alcoholic beverages taste. She, 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 she had a European mum isn't European herself, but her father was and you know, she always loved that idea of, you know, well, a degustation menu, you know, this wine goes with this, this meal and things of that nature. And, you know, when we were like seven or eight, mum was like giving us little tastes of wine. And now if mum, if you're listening to this, I know you will be listening to this. If we weren't that young, I do apologize, <laughs> but I'm, we were pretty young. Like we weren't, it wasn't like first drink at 18 and, you know, 21 in America, you just go out and you just get plastered. Yeah. Your yeah. relationship to alcohol is this forbidden thing. It's the apple, you know, in the garden of Eden. Now I can have it. And here we go. The mum was like, nah, alcohol is like a super normal thing. You give it a go. And I reckon that was, had a really great impact on, on my relationship with alcohol. Like I, yeah. even when, um, kids and stuff were going out to party, like, well, have you brought beer? So I, I never really felt like I, you know, sometimes I obviously did and I got drunk and had fun. Yeah. But then there were other times where I also didn't really care that I wasn't, um, yeah. because it was never forbidden. You know, it was yeah. always just uh, people drink alcohol, <laughs> you know? The word forbidden is such a good word because it's that, that, and, and we, in fact, we use that language, what foods are forbidden, mm. or forbidden foods. Um, so what you describe with alcohol and your mom is there was a space for it. It wasn't, it's this whole scarcity thing. Yes. If we say to any of us all the way from a young child, all the way up to an adult, you know, you, you can, you can kind of, play or look into this red and blue bucket but the yellow one don't touch yes. it you can't have it 
it's off limits. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like what are you we all do? want the yellow bucket because we're oh, like, yes. what the fuck is so special about the yellow bucket? <laughs> yeah. And so it's the same kind of, um, I think, physiology and what our brain does. So the more we can remove the forbiddenness around mm. certain foods and allow them to have a space, I see it all the time. Yeah. The the binging, the emotional eating, um, the anxiety, the food obsession starts to go down. Yeah, that's so good, isn't it? And, you know, I mean, again, you think about how we're wired and we are attracted to the unknown and novelty because yes. do we know, it's like the orienting reflex that we have. Do we, are we supposed to um, avoid it or are we supposed to walk towards it? We don't know what it is. So we have to be so hyper-focused on it. And we, 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 we render the world that we know unconscious because you know, everything in this room, I'm not really paying attention to because I know that it's not going to hurt me, you know, so that's yeah. fine, but yeah. I have to be focused on things that I don't know what they're about. Yeah. So, you know, rules are made to be broken kind of because of that. Yeah. So I think, um, Oh, that's such a, I, I just think that's a really great point. That whole yellow bucket thing, isn't it? Yeah. What, what typically happens when, when you, is that, was that one of the, in one of the principles of the. Yeah. So yeah. it's the way that I teach it is kind of make peace with food and challenge the food police. We start to do something that's called um, habituation. Mm -hmm. um, and we do it in a very kind of uh, systematic way. Mm -hmm. So it's not if, especially if someone's connecting to someone with what I'm saying, it's not just bring everything in the house and kind of, cause I do think that can be overwhelming depending sure. on someone's history. Sure. Um, but we do this habituation process where, so for example, we we're doing this in my group now mm -hmm. and we all kind of have looked at, I say we all, I've, I facilitate the group, but the women I'm working with are looking at what foods do I have these kind of beliefs about or restricting and so it might be, this is an example. Sure. One of the ladies was like, her husband wakes up in the morning and he makes a beautiful bowl of oats. And for years and years and years, she's believed all carbs are bad. I can't have that. Mm. And then kind of more recently, it's bad to eat before 12 or one. And when we dug into that a little bit, she's going, I'm hungry in the morning. Yeah. The oats look so beautiful. Yep. I would actually really love to sit with my husband and connect with him nice. and enjoy this food. Yes. And so her habituation is let's invite oats back in. Cool. And oats. Wow. And savor it mm. and enjoy it and enjoy the connection with your partner and just see what happens. Um, and and generally what happens is that it's like, oh my brain kind of starts to understand I can have oats when I want it. And then you're choosing from a more mindful, intentional place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I did it, it was, I said chocolate chip cookies earlier. It was that mm. all these beliefs about, I don't have control around this, why it's bad. A hundred reasons why it's bad. Um, but I just made them available all the time. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. And, and, and what I learned in that process is, I don't like the store-bought ones. I really like the kind of whole um, process of cooking homemade cookies and smelling them and yeah. enjoying them. And, and then it's like, I there's memories associated to it. So it's kind of like mm. this soul soothing thing of, you know, memories with my grandma or memories with my mom or my best friend in uni when we were needing to like study, she made the most beautiful chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and so it's like this whole process goes, I can reconnect to this like love mm. of food in a way that feels safe in a way where I don't feel out of control anymore. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. It, it really is. It's amazing how, I mean, food, you know, the other thing, the other thing that I was thinking about, you know, when we were talking before we we're talking about, you know, exercise and, and everything like that. And, um, it's like, you know, compensate here, 
you know, every action has an equal opposite reaction. I mean, the exercise world is a massive industry now and everyone trains every morning at 6am, you know, 6am. Who the fuck is like, (laughs) it's crazy, you know, but I used to get up at four to coach, Yeah, you know, and now, now I think about this kind of stuff and it's just interesting to me, a little bit hypocritical, I think if, if someone were to come back at you based upon what you do and say, well, that's not healthy for you. And it's like, well, let's have a conversation around that. The word midnight (laughs) means middle of the night. And yet that's when people go to bed. And then they wake up at four to train or five to train and they're training hard, hard, lifting heavy weights and sprinting for one full hour. Now I love the health and fitness industry. I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying like, why are we doing this? Let's just step back for a second and have a look at why we're doing this. And it's like, well, is it because we feel that we need to, because, well, again, if you're intuitively feeling into what you need, we've evolved to walk basically everywhere occasionally run away from something or run to kill something to eat it. And then very occasionally to lift up something heavy to put it together, to build a house. That's not an hour of heavy lifting every day, you know, but I want, I wonder how much of that need to train is being pushed by this. Like, well, I I ate all this food, therefore I have to, you you know what I mean? Yes. And, and and I think that's, this is where, when I say words like non-diet or intuitive eating or whatever, binary thinking can come up all, but you're saying, so you're saying people who want to eat quote healthy, they're bad. Or you're saying if someone goes to the gym at 6am, that's bad. No, I'm not. Mm. I'm actually not putting any moral value on that. Yeah, I'm getting people to tune into themselves and really look at, is this serving me? If so, how, or is it harmful? And for a long time, I think people can stay in denial about that. Mm, um, so like my, my partner goes to CrossFit, like, I don't know, four or five times a week at 5.00 AM. He likes it. He, it's mm. not coming from this place of like, I was bad and ate too much last night or, you know, trying to like sculpt his body to be this like absurdly not, you know, possibly attained kind of thing. Yes. It's yes. just, <clears throat> it, he feels better. We oh. sit all day as therapists. He meets his mate there he lifts weights and that's it yeah um and something else that i don't know i don't know how how you can just cut me off if you're like okay girl this is long enough episode but there's two more things to yeah let's do it one you said something about house and that's Mm -hmm. a real misconception when i think it's weird that it's so radical to say i'm not dieting anymore yeah i couldn't agree more Diet's the shit out. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who the like, fuck. What, like it, yeah, what? I agree. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Mm. And and so, but always, what comes up in this conversation is what about your health? Yeah. And there's a couple of things I encourage people to think about. One is, what does health mean to you? Mm-hmm. And are you considering all kind of areas of health? Yes. Mental, emotional, social, mm. physical, spiritual. Because what I see, especially people who are kind of trapped in this diet, diet culture place or body shame place is they're over-focused on the physical aspect of diet and exercise. And I'm kind of going, but this is really detrimental to your mental health. And socially your anxiety, you're anxious as hell about catching up with someone because Mm. you don't know what's going to be on the menu or you don't know if you're going to be allowed to eat what's there or so zooming out. And, and, and kind of having this holistic view of health. And there's also a misconception that what determines our health. And again, like if we zoom out, this is what, this is a lot of what determines our health. Trauma, stress, are, do we have access to clean air, mm. clean water, quality food? Do we have access to medical care? Um, what are our genetics? Yep. There's so many things that go into determining our health Mm. and about 30% of that is individual behavior. So in that 30%, it's things like driving behavior, (laughs) (laughs) drug and alcohol. I know. I knew that was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Smoking. Yeah. Um, loneliness. 
Like, yes, massive. Loneliness is detrimental to our health as mm. humans. And so overall, 15% of our health is diet and exercise. Mm, mm. 15. Mm-hmm. Now, I think what we've been taught is it's like that's 95% of it. Yeah. And so this is another part of coming back home to our bodies, doing this sort of work around our relationship with food is zooming out. Yeah. Hundred percent, and and you know, I, I wanted to make a final point on that because what I was trying to do then, as you were talking, was listen to what the um, arguments against would say, mm, mm. and you know, things are coming to my mind like, oh, so you're just you know making it okay for people to be super overweight or super thin or whatever it is, and yeah. and the what came to my mind when when I um. I tried, so I was listening to you, but I tried to retaliate my own ideas about what arguments would be put forward. The the podcast that I hosted um, before doing the mind mate was, it was called adventure fit radio. And um, we got a whole bunch of, we did a lot of shit talking and stuff, but we got a whole (laughs) bunch of high achievers on there. And, um, and and we're talking like the best in the world. You know, we got a lot of the top 10 CrossFit games athletes at the time. Like these are people who train five, six hours every day and they sleep in, there was one guy in particular sleeps in a sleep deprivation tank, you know, like just phenomenal. (laughs) Was that Matt Fraser? (laughs) I no, no, that was James Newbury. He's a legend actually, James Newbury. Um, We never got Matt on the show, but um, we had other really cool guys like um, Khan Porter and and things like that. Khan was a, a really great example of this because if, if you can take anything away from our conversation today, I think it's just, the, the most important thing is in life is, are you happy personally? That's it. If, if everyone was happy, there'd be no such thing as a psychologist. Great. Just so we know, <laughs> yeah. but that's what everything in life is about, you know? And if someone's happy being, you know, an insanely restrictive exerciser, great. If someone's the opposite of that, great. It actually yeah. doesn't matter. This coming back to your point about, yeah. um, you know, being amoral, especially when we're, judging other people, which we shouldn't do to begin with. Um, Khan said, now, the, again, multiple CrossFit Games athlete, just a weapon. And the reason he's so good is because he enjoys it. Yeah. That's it. And he just he just said time and time again, I'm, I'm really good at it because I like doing it. And it's just something that I get up for and it's really fun. He still enjoys drinking and, and, and whatever, but he's just really good at it because he does it a lot. There's a book called Mastery, and one of the quotes that I often refer to is that um, people who are the best at whatever they do practice all the time. Everyone knows that. But um, he said that practice isn't something that you do. It's something that you are. And so it's like, of course, we naturally do things where we're interested in. And then as a consequence of doing them repeatedly, we get really good at them. But it comes from a place of, well, this is just who I am. Yeah. Like, I like talking. I don't really like doing maths. So I'm not yeah. very good at maths, but I think I'm okay at talking, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. And better at asking <laughs> questions, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But this thing, and to me, it really speaks to a lot of what you've been talking about here. Again, it's, yeah. we, you know, no one wants to be a CrossFit Games athlete. You know, we're just using it. I've got a background and obviously your partner does it, husband. Yeah. Um, it takes a, cr- a crazy amount of training to get good at that sport. But if you really enjoy it, great, you know, and it's got to come back to all of that. It, yeah. you, no one wants to be a CrossFit Games athlete if you hate it every day because life's too short for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think my, I, I was listening to you intently too, and my head went in a couple of different directions, <laughs> but I think it, just to hit on a little bit of the body image stuff, I think what can happen is some of what we've talked about, the food and exercise can become a way of trying to manipulate our body to fit Mm. what we think it should look like. Yeah. And we think, I hear this all the time. We think, well, I just want to feel better. Mm. And it's tricky because body image work, feel better is not achieved with a six pack. Yeah. And I know, I know like, again, something I probably would have wanted to punch someone saying, you know, five years ago, but we, we can make this mistake of 
if I manipulate my body and I get it to look the way I look, that I want it to look, then, then I'll feel confident, yeah, better, happy. And what we see is one example to kind of suggest why this might not be true. I don't know if you've experienced this, but you look back on an old photo of yourself where maybe you had, you remember critiquing yourself and being maybe judgmental and you go like, now you're looking back at a photo, like there was nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I've had that. I have had that. Yeah. yeah. And so it shows us this body image healing is in our minds and in our hearts. It's, it's, it's not in a scale or in the mirror. Yes. You know, and that's the tricky part. I think people can start chasing with punitive exercise uh, restrictive or fad diets is they're actually chasing something underneath potentially weight loss. Yeah. I want to feel more confident. I want to feel happy. I want to feel connected. I want a sense of belonging. And so, mm. which is all, you know, to tie back in what we were saying, that's part of our health too. And so, yeah, I, one of the questions I will typically ask is if we put weight on the side, what are you actually pursuing? Mm. And can we work and pursue those things in your now body? Yes. Yeah. What does the wanting want? Yeah. What does the wanting want? Whereas what I see is we postpone parts of our lives. And that's the part that makes me saddest is um, tell me from a, well, I know you can't speak for all men, just like I can't speak for all women, but from, I'm going to do a, it. All men are. <laughs> <laughs> but, but from what I see with the women I work with is they have this idea again that they need to achieve a certain body size or appearance and they postpone the level of happiness mm -hmm. believing i need to reach this before i can and what that looks like is i'm going to hide in photos with my children i'm going to wear the black outfit to try to hide all the quote flaws with my body maybe there's a business dream but i can't do that until i lose 50 pounds yeah um maybe i see this too there's a body movement where people are like, I so want to do this. Like, I want to go to a kickboxing class, but they go, but first I need to lose weight. Yeah. Oh, to, yeah, to, yeah. Right. To like reach totally. this, this body size or appearance, and then I'll do this. And so this is something yes. else. It's a gentle invitation to people to think about if they set aside body, physical goals or weight loss or whatever it is, what's the wanting wanting as you say yeah do you, um, do you know what i hear all the time yeah it's it is sorry to cut you off i no. just i have to inject this quickly yeah <laughs> what i heard no shit i probably heard this 80 times so yeah. i was a crossfit coach for about 10 years and and siobhan would attest to this too she was one as well did you say crossfit yeah, I was crossing oh, coach shit. for about I 10 didn't... years. Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but eight, eight years, I think, eight to nine years. I was in the fitness industry for 10 years. But yeah, anyway, um, I really want to start CrossFit, but I just want to get fit first. 80 times, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and obviously the question is, how do you think you get fit? <laughs> well, yeah. But, but also it's like, why are you stay curious about why you're withholding a potentially super cool experience Yes. before you like, and, and part of this, I have to put this in the conversation, which is part of this is weight stigma. Mm. And so there is a real reality to, if someone is in a larger body, they do suffer discrimination, yeah. more bullying. They're less likely to be hired, but going into a fitness space, in a oh, larger sure. body can it's tough yeah i mm. yes and and i'm speaking i think from i don't think i have lived experience in this but listening to my clients and women who come through my group describe what it's like for them in a larger body to walk into for example a fitness space mm -hmm. and so it's this it's this complexity that comes up of you deserve to pursue the deeper want mm. in your now body. Um, and we can hold that there's systemic things going on that can make that feel pretty damn challenging for some people. Well, wasn't there now, wasn't now there was a man named Vincent Folletti 
do you know Vincent Folletti? Was he, he, I think he did research on obesity in the early nineties and he found that of his huge sample size, you know, probably like 900 people or something like that. 52% of them had suffered sexual abuse as, mm-hmm. as, as children. Yeah. And, and he would ask him, I'm, I'm 99% sure that his name is Vincent Folletti. Um, but, um, he would ask them and he would say, you know, what's going on? And, and they would have a lady, I think it was a lady who lost all this weight. And then she came back to him and, and put it all on or something like that. And, and he said, Oh, what happened? And she said, Oh, a man, um, you know, flirted with me at the bar. And it's like, Oh, you know, isn't that great? And she's like, yeah, it's great. But, um, and I'm obviously paraphrasing a heap, yeah, here, yeah, but yeah. The, the, the idea behind it, I wasn't there. She didn't say it was great, but, yeah. um, you know, she had no issues with the flirtation or him trying to pick her up or something like that. Um, but she said, you know, the whole idea behind it was one of the reasons why I put on weight was so I would never have to be touched again. Like mm-hmm. my father did or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and there's this idea is like, really just opposing idea is that one of the reasons um, that came from that research was that a lot of people who gain weight is to protect themselves. So they're bigger and stronger to fight, you know, which is what their inner child would have wanted, or it's to make themselves. And this is the really tough part um, to make themselves so ugly quote unquote, so that they'd never have that happen again. And that that's really confronting research, but it, it really shines a light on just how deep, uh, the work that you're doing runs, you know, deep within um, our our childhoods and, and, and conditioning. Yeah. And it's, we could do a whole podcast episode on this because it, to me, it's, it's a tricky conversation to move into because there is lots of weight stigma, even within research. Mm. And so it's, there's this idea that like a quote fat person is, but there's a skinny person inside but sometimes it's like, no, body diversity is normal. Mm-hmm. Like, it's normal. We're mm. not, we could all eat, exercise, do the same shit, and we're all going to look different. And it's tricky because there is, I'm not familiar with this research, but there's research almost trying to figure out, but like, why are fat people fat? Or these like assumptions of like, well, they're just lazy or there's unresolved trauma there. And it's tricky because people in thin bodies also have unresolved traumas and the yeah. rate of sexual assault is the last time I looked is one in three women and one in six boys. Yeah. Yeah. And so, insane, and then research it? can put on the glasses and go like, that's a good point. I think this is um, what it is. This is why it's like, well, yes, that's one yes. thing maybe. Yeah. But at the end it, of the day, it's like diversity is just, diversity <laughs> yeah and and yes this is a part that if this is a part of body image work too and this helped me immensely is um so giving your brain information with diverse bodies mm. and this is this is so good to do on social media so fat bodies skinny bodies people of different races skin textures we yep. haven't even talked about that but things like right. acne or um, or cellulite or stretch marks. Like mm. there's all these things that are kind of just natural, naturally part of the body just things. existent. Yeah. And um, yeah. that helped me because it, it just gave my brain a different visual than what I grew up with, which is you need to be as white and as skinny as humanly possible. Mm. Like I grew up, this is dating myself, but I grew up, you're probably so much younger than me uh, is is uh 14 mary kate, 14 <laughs> mary kate nashley olsen yeah that was like me and my sister grew up watching that and and yeah yeah and, and so that was kind of the body ideal that i thought yes. we had to have where um so yeah there's a whole world and i'm certainly not an expert in it um which again i think people discomfort can come up defenses can come up wanting to jump to the binary thinking can Mm. come up but there's a whole world of and literature on weight stigma and assumptions and judgments we hold about people in larger bodies that's a really Um, great point it is a really great point the, the the best example i can think of that to to demonstrate this is if a fat person goes to the doctor 
they're statistically less likely to get the medical intervention that they're needing, right? Mm. So if a fat person goes to the doctor, say for, I mean, I'm going to be super silly about it, like a sore big toe. Yep. They're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're likely to get the advice, you, you just need to lose weight. Go yeah. home and lose weight. A thin person is more likely to get, you know what? Maybe I'll do like a sore knee. <laughs> We're going to do a scan to make sure nothing's wrong. And we're going to send you to a physio so we can help you with mobility. And so it's kind of this lazy medicine that starts to happen of a fat person's actually treated differently um, and told the solution to all of your issues is right. lose weight. Right. And so, yeah, it's like I said, it's such a nuanced, complex area where I don't feel like I'm the expert, but if, 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 I'm curious what you're thinking as I'm saying this, but I'm also a, the listener kind of just notice if there's like defenses or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You're or or, not, or yeah, if yeah. you hear me saying some kind of like good or bad binary right now, cause I'm not. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What no, are you I mean, thinking? Well, like, the first thing that I wanted to um, hit was, you know, it's a good point that you made before because it's like, wow, there's a really interesting, you know, and obviously when you do, um, when you study um, data um, and statistics in, in psychology, it's only ever correlation analyses, you know, and, and correlation is, hey, did you know that roosters make the sunrise because they like cock-a-doodle-doo in the morning? And that's I, that's, that's would, such a good way to describe it. You know, it's like, well, no, there's a correlation though, and it's a yeah. significant correlation, so that's yeah. important, but, you know, the effect would be, quite small <laughs> because yes. the sun just rises of its own accord. But yeah. I think your point is really good when the whole thing before the assumption is because this is this significant um, association with childhood trauma and obesity. Well, if we could sort out the, 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 the trauma, then we won't have obesity, you know, and, and what I think you're saying, if I'm hearing correctly is, is that fundamentally an issue now? Straight away, people are going to go, well, yeah, because there are some serious health concerns with obesity and, and everything. I think we, we, we need to, and I think this is where the nuance is, we need to get to a point where people are old enough, as my, you know, year nine teacher would say, old enough and ugly enough to make their own decisions. You know, I, for, as an example, last night, you know, I'm a stereotypically um, healthy person, right? Yeah three beers, pizza, potato wedges, you know, probably not a good idea, you know, <laughs> all good. I don't care. It's, it's who I want to be in this world, you know, is it's different from you. It's different from someone who's really thin. It's different from someone who's super overweight, yeah. but that doesn't matter. You know, it's got to come to this. We, we need to create a society, you know, if we're all, if we're all for this freedom thing, you know, it's like, well, whatever the fuck you want to do is sweet. Yeah. You know, that's great. Yeah. yeah. That's what and I'm it's, hearing. It's, it's what you said, I think, is the whole um, correlation, not causation. And when you really dive into some of the research, there's been really broad statements made um, that at best may be some correlation, but mm -hmm. not causation. And, you know, something that really breaks my heart that I've seen over the years is, if, if we look at eating disorders, only about 6% of people who struggle with eating disorders are quote underweight, 6%. Mm. And so the result of some of that is if someone is in a larger body, they, they will potentially be having the same food behaviors as a thin person. Wow. But the, but the food behavior and the fat person is rewarded and the food behavior and the thin person is this is disordered eating. And let's mm. maybe talk about a referral to someone who can help you with that. That's where the weight stigma stuff can create such heartbreak and pain. Mm. Um, and so I've had women like this who come in and they're in larger bodies and they've seen GP after GP and maybe psychologist after psychologist and they've been supported to engage in their eating disorder with the hopes of losing weight. And, um, and, and I'm kind of often the first person to go, did you know this is an eating disorder? And they go, 
I didn't think I could have an eating disorder. Why hasn't anyone else picked that up? Right. Mm. It's kind of, if, if a, if a fat person goes in and goes, Oh, I'm eating 500 calories a day. I'm working out a lot. Right. right? Like um, I'm really trying to get this weight off. They're often rewarded. If a thin person goes in and goes, I'm eating 500 calories a day. I'm working out two hours a day. Then they're met with, Oh, that's a bit concerning. Yeah. And so to me, it's kind of, I'm a big fan of zoom out. Yes. Treat every person like a full human Mm -hmm. and support them in a way that, that they're needing. I will get Mm -hmm. off this soapbox, Mm -hmm. but the last thing I'll say is something I see is I call, I didn't coin this term, but it's called health trolling Mm -hmm. where if someone is chubby or fat or in a bigger body and I don't know, say they're like dancing. Yeah. Often there's these health trolls that jump on going like, oh my God, but like, you really need to lose weight. Like what's making all these assumptions about this person based on their body size. Mm. And it's, to me, it's going, well, one is you don't know that person's inner world, anything. their relationship. You don't know anything about yeah. their body size. Yeah. And the other thing is shaming them in a comment section is not going to help them anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, it's it's so, such a reflection of that person. Yeah. No one writes a comment going, oh, man, I, I hope they read this. Like, I, this is going to be really important for them. <laughs> no and no one that. reads a mean comment and goes, you know what? That really motivated me to yeah, take it, some action that to worked. support myself. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> it's just so shaming. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, look, Vanessa, as we do outside of the podcast, we could talk um, I know. Um, for hours and, and we will, we'll do it. We'll do it again for sure. Cause there's so many different areas we, we, yes. could, we could go into, but let talk about this program just um, quickly. Where can people oh, find yes, you? Yes. Um, what's um, um, what's coming up in this space? Yes. So I'm my favorite place on social media is Instagram. So it's Vanessa yep. underscore Preston underscore. Um, the website is Green Life Psychology. Yeah. Um, my podcast is Body and Food Freedom Podcast. Um, and the group I run is my absolute passion. So it's a 16-week group. Um, it's live once a week. It's it's for women. And we really walk through this process of self-compassion, shame resiliency, body image healing, and intuitive eating. And like mm-hmm. I said, I always come back to a place of autonomy. So I want the women who finish my program to feel more confident and feel, trust themselves more, not put me as the authority figure. I want them to come back home to themselves. Yeah. Um, and I have a freebie coming up. Oh, um, cool. I have a super exciting offer coming up um, in addition to this group program. So I would encourage people if if you feel like you're curious about my work, follow along and um, there's some cool stuff coming up. Oh, you've just given us the yellow bucket. <laughs> now now we have to you're like, hey, this is really cool. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's so cool. <laughs> it's in a so yellow exciting. bucket. <laughs> yeah. um, That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So Vanessa underscore press and underscore green life psychology. That is your clinic with your husband. Yes. Is that right? Yes. 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 So there's four of us. Okay, cool. Yes. Awesome. And then body, food and freedom, which is the podcast. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll chuck all that in the show notes, of course. And yeah. Hey, thanks so much for coming Thank on the show. Thank you so much. I love this conversation. Yeah. 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 Thank it's you always so much. good. Yeah. You know, like I said in the beginning, it, you fun, it's fun to see where it goes. And yeah. um, I think for me personally, selfishly, I like to do that so I can learn in real time. Um, yeah. So. And I didn't even need any of my notes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Exactly. But you had them. Yeah. So yeah. the anxiety was like, sweet. We got it. We got it yes. under control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, guys, hey, thanks so much for listening and um, have a great day. Have a great, great day. Bye for now.